So now, Larry, where's Larry hiding? Oh, here's Larry. <laughs> Larry will talk to us about watering trees during the drought, which ones and when. And um, thank you, Larry. Here's a, a let's get your. Sorry. Which one's you, Larry? Do the July 4th one? Or Sorry? July 7th? Which one is yours? No, it's the eight bag. Thank you, Nancy. It's good to be here. I'm the uh, the old Igor. I, <laughs> I I preceded Igor with the University of California uh, for 30 years. Now I'm doing some consulting work, um, and I hope you're all very well convinced of the benefits of trees at this point. Um, I think if you weren't before, certainly should be now after the excellent presentations by the uh, previous speakers. Um, I was thinking 20 years ago, we really didn't have a lot of this information. And it was a hard argument to make for a lot of city councils and elsewhere. But now we do have strong arguments. And so it's very, very nice to be able to stand up in front of a, a, a council or another group and, and really tell them the benefits of trees. And thank all the researchers and educators who have done a good job in, in that regard. And now I'm going to talk about how to keep these, uh, these, the, the trees alive, um, and whether it be during a drought or in non-drought years. I think these are things that you might want to consider um, as you know, good water management uh, 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 strategies for trees. Um, and so, And my glasses on, figure out which way to go here. Here we go. I think that should do it. Uh, the first point I want to make is that um, a, a, a lot of trees are very tolerant of fairly summer dry conditions. Uh, a lot of trees in our landscape. Uh, certainly we have um, our California native trees, uh, as you can see here. Um, these happen to be uh, Engelman Oaks down in Santa Rosa. Um, the Santa Rosa Plateau in San, San Diego County, but it's also um, uh, Blue Oaks in um, Sacramento County. We, we have a, a good number of species that are very well adapt to summer, adapted to summer dry conditions. And, and we have to recognize that. Um, not all tree species need irrigation during the summer months. Um, and this is, I think, what um, Igor is kind of referring to and saying, you know, maybe we should lean towards some of these species and away from some of the other species that do require larger amounts of water. And I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a minute. Um, and so we have this experience to, to build on, and, and we recognize that. You drive by them on the way home today and, and so on. Um, but we also have the urban experience where we have a number of situations uh, that, you know, if you look around, you'll see that there are uh, trees in non-irrigated areas. And this is a case in San Francisco where you have a number of eucalyptus and acacia and pine um, planted on a windy hillside. It's sandy. And they get how much irrigation during the summer months? That much, zero, they're not irrigated. So we do have species that are quite resilient in, when it comes to water and, and you know, they have mechanisms for being resilient. And in my mind, a lot of that has to do with root system development and being able to develop very extensive root systems. Uh, they couldn't do that if they had restricted root systems. They couldn't be up there uh, throughout the, the summer. And then you say, well, you know, that's San Francisco, you know, cool climate, you know, apply the factor. Well, you can look around and, and, and I'm, I'm going to just show you a couple of pictures. Here's a uh, acacia melanoxalon, blackwood acacia in a parking lot planting area. How much water does that get during the summer months? It's zero. 
Um, and looking okay? Yeah. Uh, so we, 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 we really need to appreciate the resilience of trees and in, in their adaptability, many of our species. Now you say, well, that's a low water using species. You know, you might expect it from that. Well, here are some Chinese pistache, and they're rated as a little higher using. They're, you know, it's, it's still low, but it's higher than the blackwood acacia. Um, and here they are growing in a, in a median in Davis, a little warmer than Marin. Um, how much water are they getting? None during the summer months. Um, yes, they are in a deep soil, and that has a whole lot to do with it. Um, are they tapping into sewer lines? Well, I kind of doubt it. Is this the exception? In other words, is there a broken water line or sewer line below them? No. We have lots of cases like this. Um, just a, a last one. This is a um, uh, uh, street tree in Sacramento, an orange tree. Not a common street tree by any means. And it's producing a fair crop of oranges. Um, typically, these trees are irrigated for how long after planting? Three years. About, yeah, about three years. About three years. And then what? They're on their own. And some don't make it, but many do. And, and so I think we need to appreciate that. This is what's, what we consider a more of a moderate using water, uh, species. Um, but it's doing quite well. And again, you know, uh, there, there are caveats to this, you know, and one is being, they have a capacity to develop large or extensive root systems, but if they're limited in terms of soil conditions, all bets are off, and I'll, I'll talk about that, okay? So this is a good starting point, just recognizing resilience of trees. And I, I think it's really a, a good take home message in terms of if you really want to conserve water, trees are a good bet. If you can irrigate them for the first three years and then many do well, not all, but many do well on their own. And certainly it's the ones that are a little more drought tolerant uh, that are considered relative to others that are considered in, in this category or, or the blackwood acacia category that, that are gonna really tough it out. Those are the ones that we wanna think about and, 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 and lean towards in terms of our plant palette. And I think Igor was uh, mentioning that um, and its importance. So now let's uh, look at um, some cases where you really do wanna consider irrigating trees, okay? Yes, some don't need to be irrigated even in drought years, some species are going to really tough it out. But there are other cases where you've got to pay attention. And this is where we potentially uh, are going to lose trees. These are trees at risk during the drought and, and even during non-drought years, as, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so first, um, trees that are in lawns, uh, especially during the drought. Um, and uh, there's been a, a lot of um, movement towards minimizing turf and reducing irrigation uh, to turf. And, and, and that's fine, I'm all for that. Um, yeah, but if there's a tree in the turf, you can't ignore it. You have to consider that because oftentimes that tree, not always, but oftentimes the tree will have uh, dependence on the water that's being applied for the turf. It's developed under those conditions. And now you shut that off and you can leave a tree high and dry. So you have to th think about that. This, this large cork oak, or excuse me, coast live oak in, in the lawn, this is in Visalia, um, warm summer area. And um, you shut off the lawn there, the, the lawn irrigation. My guess is that the tree may, you know, be affected a little bit. But um, that, that size tree in a really deep soil with a very extensive root system, this may be one of the, 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 the exceptions that it, it may be able to get through it. But certainly, you don't want to ignore it. You want to keep your eye on it if water is withdrawn. Uh, other cases where you have more sensitive species, coast redwood in a lawn in Sacramento on the left, 
uh, the, the, the water was cut off and, and these went down in short order in the, in the same year. Um, this, you know, of course, Coast Redwood is considered in the high water use category. Um, it's appropriate in, in an irrigated turf, but when you cut the irrigation off, then you're gonna have problems. So you, you really, if you wanna preserve these trees, you're gonna have to think about um, some, some way of irrigating them after the turf irrigation has been removed. Uh, on the right um, is the uh, 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 Southern Magnolia, again, in a turf area that, that um, has been retired or abandoned, and um, it's showing severe uh, water stress symptoms. Igor, do you have a, a pointer? Oh, right in front of me, sorry about that. There we go. Okay, back up. Heavy duty. All right. So here's here's the southern magnolia, and you can see a, a lot of leaf drop as a result of um, discontinuing the turf irrigation. Um, here's just a, a small example, small photo as well. Um, in uh, Marin County this year, um, the turf in the median is being um, uh, retired and uh, the, the, the contractor was hired to install irrigation in and around these conifers to um, help them uh, survive after the, uh, the irrigation has been cut off, uh, at least for the turf. Um, uh, another key case, this is the second case, the first case, of course, is trees and lawns, but it, it, trees that um, really have higher water requirements, uh, what I would call sensitive species, um, such as white birch. I think we're missing the, uh, the, the, the title up top here. I don't know if this can be lowered or, oh, there it is, okay. You can see it on your left and right. So species with relatively high water requirements, um, such as, as birch, this, this was a mistake. This was, you know, designed by a professional landscape architect and installed in, in the Central Valley here. And um, mixing uh, um, Arctostaphylus and, and birch is not a good mix. Uh, this is not hydrozoning. This is the antithesis of hydrozoning. Um, but we, we re really need to gravitate away from these trees and two trees that are a lot more resilient, the species. But if you have these and you want to um, retain them during the, the drought years, these are the ones you need to keep an eye on. Alder, birch, willow, coast redwood, so on, that are in that higher water use category. If you have a question about what category they're thought to be in, check the Wuckles for uh, database. Uh, it's online. Just Google Wuckles 4. You can put in Oakland and it'll give you a list of species and it'll find out exactly what is regarded as their water needs. High, moderate, low, or very low. Okay, all that information is right there. So you can avoid this outcome or avoid uh, having plantings uh, where you have a, a high water user uh, right in with a very low water user. Um, it's certainly sensitive species planted in windy areas. That's a bad combination, bad mix. And that's something that you need to keep an eye on. Um, the third case situation where you want to uh, um, watch is uh, trees planted in restrictive soils. As I mentioned, a major strategy for trees to develop resilience in terms of water and water deficits is, is develop extensive root systems. If they're blocked from doing this, then you have a, a, a very poor situation relative to um, avoiding water deficits, such as in parking lots. Um, here's a, a, an ash. And this is in Marin County. This is a, a shopping center parking lot. And uh, I you know, know something about this tree. I was on the, this is going back a few years, I was on the landscape crew that uh, dug the holes for these trees. And uh, we used jackhammers, not shovels, 
jackhammers to get through the soil. And basically carved out a, a pit, put the tree in, and it grew. But all of a sudden, it grew to a point where it was too big for that pit. It's in a restrictive soil. It can't develop roots out extensively into the body of soil. As a result, it starts to decline at a certain point. As soon as it over exceeds the capacity of this planting hole to support it, in the planting pit, then it starts to flake out. Uh, this is something that you really want to avoid in the first place. Uh, certainly, there are some planting pits or locations that really shouldn't be planted into. Um, just maybe, you know, cover it up and go on to the next site where you have a better soil condition. Uh, here are some London Plain over in Alameda County um, that, you know, London Plain uh, can do better than that. Um, they're not performing well, um, and they're in a very difficult site where it's considered to be a heat island, a lot of reflected light. Um, you need everything going for you as a tree to be able to survive well here. And, and one is to be able to develop you know, roots throughout the, the body of soil. Um, couldn't do that here. As a result, you see some poor performance. This is really what you want to avoid. And this really, I, I think, begs us to really look closer at soil prep prior to planting, spending a little more time on that and getting that right rather than getting the tree in that afternoon um, because of some schedule, some arbitrary schedule. It's very much more important to make sure you have good quality conditions. And that way we can have uh, um, uh, generate the benefits of trees with minimum resources such as water. Um, so we have lots of soil types. Uh, if we all have this soil, such as in Davis, nice, deep, alluvial, beautiful soil, um, you know, we, 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 we don't need, need degrees in horticulture to grow trees in this. I mean, this is just perfect stuff um, and unrestricted to root development, and that's why we have a lot of beautiful orchards in the Central Valley in, in some of these soils because of the deep soils. I uh, go to South San Francisco, and you have very compact, dense soils. Here's a black layer, which indicates an anaerobic condition. This is basically underwater during the winter months. Um, very difficult situation here, and you're going to have to do something to remediate the condition before planting. But this is going to really restrict uh, development of, of trees, and it's going to ask for more water to keep it alive. It's a fragile system. Here in San Mateo County, um, very shallow soils, as you can see, uh, not much to, 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 um, for roots to develop into here, some bedrock. Um, these are going to be difficult sites. These are what I call restrict, well, others call restrictive soils. Here's a, a, a park in San Francisco um, where it was an industrial site, and this is probably one of these sites where you just don't want to plant a tree in there. Uh, I can put the petunia in there, but not, not a tree. Um, here's a, a, a case in point. Um, this is in San Mateo. Uh, cork oak, if you're familiar with that species, you know it's, it's pretty, pretty tough, you know, and resilient in terms of water requirements. It's in the, uh, the probably the low water category. Um, and yet, here you see it in a, in a median. It's growing well. You know, when they were planted, they're small guys, and then they've developed well over the years. But now, all of a sudden, they've exceeded the capacity of this median to support that much vegetation. And they're starting to decline. You can see the, the, the color of the leaves, the density of the canopy, a lot of leaf drop, and so on. And so this is a situation where, yes, you want to get the hose out or find some way to irrigate these trees, um, especially during the drought. This was, um, as I recall, Mark, this was a non-drought year when we looked at this. Um, but um, uh, this would be aggravated, certainly, in, in a low rainfall year. Um, so uh, when you uh, uh, do 
uh, recognize that this is water stress um, as a result of a re restricted uh, soil volume here. Uh, you get the hose out and you can really see some recovery as a result of irrigation. Um, and it, uh, basically, uh, as I recall, there's a fire hydrant over here. Um, flood irrigate the area, um, get them hydrated again, and they start to respond very nicely. Uh, the question is, the problem, or the, the problem is that the, it, it's, the challenge is, isn't over you still have a lot of vegetation in a, a limited resource location. And um, perhaps it's time to thin this out and, and reduce the vegetation, okay? But just being aware of these situations that exist is important. Um, on a local level, you can have uh, planting uh, locations that are very, well, that are very restrictive, as you can see here in this median. Uh, you're planting into road base here. You go up a, a few feet right up here, and you have a, a less restrictive soil condition. This is where you want to plant the tree. This is where you want to fill it in without planting the tree. And this is where, the, 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 uh, as a result of restrictive soil conditions, root development will be restricted, and water will need to be applied in spoonfuls on this tree on a regular basis to keep it alive. And that's not something that you want to get into, especially when there's a lot of uh, time, uh, demands on maintenance hours. Okay. Um, a fourth uh, situation where you uh, want to consider irrigation is the trees that have lost roots, cutting, ripping, crushing. However, the roots are lost, have been lost. That's a situation you really want to pay attention to in terms of irrigation needs. Um, these, uh, it, uh, we, we all know, I, I, I hope we all know that um, it, when you lose roots, you're going to create water deficits in a tree. And here's a, an oak in, an in a construction zone, and we're going to be a lot of root loss. So when this happens, be prepared to irrigate. When this happens, you can see this magnolia in San Francisco. It was uh, trenched on this side and on this side for a sewer pipe replacement. Um, and the result three months later is a sh large amount, at least 50% of the leaf area, uh, going onto the ground. Um, severe water stress as a result of root cutting. Uh, pay attention to those trees. Um, here, you know, various cases, lots of cases where we have this happening. So be prepared to irrigate. Here's a, a oak down the Central Valley. You know changes has occurred around this tree. Um, it, it preceded this roadway, curbing, and so on. Roots have been lost. Time to irrigate. Um, also, where you have orchestrated root loss, such as in transplants, um, you can expect uh, uh, the response to be water deficit, and, and irrigation or water management is a key. This is a coast live oak transplanted in, at the Filoli Center. Um, right after uh, transplanting, it looked like this, and then with, with good water management, it looked fine. It, it started going, amazingly enough after a lot of the roots have been cut. Um, here's a case over in, in, in the Fremont area where a very large expensive tree was cut out of the ground, Coast Live Oak, a beautiful tree, signature tree for this new development. And um, it was tr transported and moved it to the location, the entry to the development, and this is what it looked like sh shortly after um, it was transplanted. And this is largely a result of a lack of water management. This is a tremendous loss. The tree and certainly funds to whoever did this, you know, whoever financed it. Um, luckily enough, they, they did uh, consult with a consulting arborist. Um, prior to this going down the hill all the way. And um, he came in with a good water management plan, and lo and behold, that tree came out and did a huge turnaround uh, as a result of good water management and some pest management as well. So be very careful, especially with transplants. 
You really have to have a water management plan. You have to stay on top of it. This is time to get the moisture sensors out, put them in the root ball, put them in the soil next to the root ball, and so on. Use everything we have to maintain um, hydration in the tray because it's lost 90% of its root system. It's in intensive care. Um, as Igor mentioned, newly uh, planted container stock is really uh, needs to be irrigated. Um, the recommendation is if you want to plant trees uh, uh, during the drought, wait until the fall or in the winter when we have some irrigation, you know, and, and, and uh, do it then. If you plant them, they are going to need to be irrigated. This is the number one cause of failure of newly planted trees, in my experience at least is they just don't get enough water. Here we can see Carpinus, um, and it's just a, a lack of irrigation, plain and simple. So, okay. Um, here you can see uh, some uh, Chinese evergreen elms, very dense heads, windy locations, newly planted, and uh, as a result of uh, lack of irrigation, you start to see some uh, dehydration and, and water deficit symptoms. Water management is key for newly planted trees. Also, uh, making sure that you have decent quality stock really helps. Uh, the root system has to be able to become extensive. And if you have constrictions and knots and, you know, kinked roots, um, sorry, um, uh, such as here, um, you're not going to develop the, the extensive root system that you need. Um, and this is a much better situation. This is what we should be shoot, shooting for. I'm not sure what, um, in terms of root systems of, of newly planted container stock or, or container stock in general. Um, the sixth case is, is trees in containers. Uh, I, I generally really don't recommend putting trees in containers. Um, they are gonna grow too big in most cases. If you do a good job, they're gonna grow too big. So you're kind of defeating yourself. Um, so be very careful. If you have them on your irrigation system, fine. But it's better to put low-statured material in, in the containers rather than a, a large ficus that's just not going to make it unless you're out there irrigating every day. Um, and lots of cases, uh, containers can be below ground as well. These sycamore were planted into vaults below ground. One other case that you want, might want to keep in mind for irrigation is, is where fill is, uh, has occurred, whether it be around a, a native oak or other trees. Um, once a fill occurs, then the root system is down below the fill. And it's very hard to get water down to the root system. So the root system now can become low and dry. Um, it's easy to irrigate this soil. And we've tried to do this, get water down, and it is challenging. So just be aware, in fill soils, if you start to see trees going down, and certainly you have to have a well around a tree that's had fill around it. That, that's, that's the number one requirement. But you have to pay attention to irrigation and, and water management in the root zone in, in fill trees. Um, Lastly, I'll, I'll mention um, trees where wa water has been diverted away from them also are at risk, uh, whether it be during the drought or non-drought years. Here's an interceptor ditch, and now water is being diverted away from this oak. Um, and as a result, this oak may need some help um, uh, after, after this ditch has been put in place. It's the same with uh, where perhaps you have a, a lot of uh, water, uh, groundwater pumping and trees that were tapped into a water table and now are, 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 are above it. Um, where water has been diverted, uh, you might consider that in terms of irrigation. And lastly, Igor mentioned this, and it's a very important one to consider, is trees that are vulnerable to pests as, uh, uh, when they're water stressed, such as Monterey Pine in Marin County on a hillside that's not irrigated, um, then you add in low rainfall a year, you're asking for, you're inviting uh, the engraver beetle to come in and, and knock it off. 
Um, and Igor gave the example, the longhorn borer, it's similar. Um, so certainly some trees are at higher risk in terms of where they are um, for water deficits and water stress. Um, these are, and some of the eucalyptus are, not all of them, but some are. So with that, I'm going to stop because the, the, the time is up and I don't want to go into the lunch hour. Um, and Nancy will take questions later. Actually, yeah, I do have to leave at lunch, so if you have a, a question, um, I'd be happy to, to take it, or, take a couple questions. or I'll be around during okay. the lunch hour. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can either, what do you want to do? You want to share your question with Larry and everyone right now, or just take, talk to him separately? Go any eat. <laughs> it's time for lunch. There's I'll be around. You can ask me uh, during the break. Oh, nailed it. I, I would think so, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, you know, the key part of what Nelda said was thin soils, and so when you have that condition and you know it exists, those are trees that you want to pay attention to. And I, I tried to mention that with the the restrictive soils. So um, I would say that you know, especially if it's an older tree, that you know is less in a defensive uh, mode. You know, it can't defend itself or, or respond, especially to insect uh, 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 borers and, and beetles. I would say this would be a good time to, to hydrate the, the, the tree and, and uh, you know, build up its defenses um, uh, by maintaining a high hydration level. Could you also talk about uh, irrigating deciduous trees while they're setting buds for next year? Um, yeah, that's a good point. And perhaps should have been added to this presentation. But, um, you know, uh, you can do a lot in terms of um, uh, setting the tree in good shape or, or having it in good shape for the following year, for a growth cycle in the following year by maintaining hydration levels in, in the fall. So if things are very dry, if we don't get rain until this December, God forbid, but if that happens, then consider irrigating in October, November for, for some of the trees, such as uh, some of the deciduous trees. Anything you'd add to that, Nelda? No, I did see a lot of poor performance in spring and dry as well. David. Yeah, I would say that, that, that some of that is drought, but I think also a lot of it is a lack of chill during the winter months. We had a very mild winter, as probably all of you know, and, and we had some really confused plants coming into spring where it would be a late leaf out or late flowering or inconsistent flowering. Part of the tree would flower, other part wouldn't. This tree would flower, this tree wouldn't, that, that kind of thing very variable conditions. And I think a lot of that had to do with the lack of winter chilling um, in, in the fruit trees and, and some of the other trees as well. It still seems like the branches are alive, but they just haven't pushed out. The buds haven't broken. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so uh, some drought, you know, it's case by case yeah. as well. Okay. David. I was going to ask you the same question about chanticleer pears that just didn't even flower. I mean, I mean the, the, the flower, the white plumage didn't come out, and they, they're alive branches, but I, I just can't imagine it's drought. So I, I think the, the lack of chill maybe is the answer to that question. Or performance totally on that. Yeah. Chanticleer pears. Um. Could be other factors involved, but right now, the top of my list is, is, is the lack of chill. Yeah. There was another question. Yeah, in the back. Um, for a large established tree that you suspect is suffering from drought, um, showing, starting to show signs, how much water is realistic to take in that? Yeah, that 
Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question to answer um, because you can estimate that based upon the size of the crown and so on. And that leaves you with a, a difficult challenge in terms of trying to get that much water into the, the soil. Uh, my recommendation is investigate your soil and try to find out how deep it is and you know whether there's variability around the tree. And if you have a, a couple of feet of soil and you can irrigate that, you can get water to that, fill that up, fill it up. And, and, and whatever it takes to do that, injections, soaker hoses, handheld hose, sprinklers, whatever it takes just to fill that up without allowing water to run off and then stop, you know, once it's filled. And the only way you can tell that is by doing what? Looking. Yeah, dig a hole or dig into it. You can see whether the, the, the moisture status is high. It's best to check it before you start to irrigate, while you're irrigating, and then when you think you're done. Uh, but, you know, be, be prepared to stop. Y you know, you, you don't put 25 gallons of gas into your 20 gallon gas tank. Don't try to do that in the soil. You know, there are limits in the water holding capacity of a, a certain volume of soil. And the only no way you know the limit is to check um, while you're irrigating and, and when you think it's, it's completed. Okay? Thank you very much.